So, on the line, we should have Terry McGinty from the University of Essex in the UK. Hello, John. Hi, cool. I can hear you all loud and clear. Good, good. So, you have another education themed talk to be giving us today titled Class Excursions to Ignite Children's Enthusiasm in Microbes. So I'm just going to hand over to you, basically, because you've got 20 minutes and I think you probably have enough to say. Um, and I'll see you at the end. So, yeah, just check your... Have you got slides to share? Yes, I have. Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen now. And Can you OK? Yes. Oh, it's just loading. Um... I'll just check to make sure it works before I go. Yes, we see your presentation. Okay, great. I'll just get out of the way so I'm not distracting. And yeah, you've got 20 minutes. Let's learn about some. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, a big thank you to the organizers. It's great to be part of this uh, exciting day. Uh, I'm Terry McGannity from the University of Essex, and I'll be talking about class excursions to ignite children's enthusiasm like those. So first of all, the big uh, main message about why microbiology literacy in general, that we've just been hearing about, uh, and class excursions in particular, are important. First of all, microbes and their activities are vital to the functioning of human health and the planet. Uh, think that Every second breath we take half the oxygen is produced by marine microbes. Half the cells in our body are microbial. And these things affect everyday decisions. So everything from when you should wash your hands, uh, when you should take antibiotics, what are the consequences of disposing of them inappropriately. If I have a bit of bioplastic, for example, it's labeled bioplastic, can I put it in my compost? Will it degrade? Will the bacteria degrade it? These are all important questions and, and hundreds more besides. But the problem is microbes are essentially invisible. They have a major image problem as well. So who should we be um, aiming at really to, to, to encourage microbes? literacy, well, essentially everyone, given that all the decisions that people make, a lot of the decisions that people make are microbiologically based, but particularly children. They're incredibly receptive, they're the adults of the future, and they share information. How should we be doing this? Well, many of the ways explored in the previous session uh, at the International Microbiology Day, they should be enjoyable, of course, hands-on and real exposure to examples of microbiology activities. And the result should be really tangible links between microbes and their activities with the result of making microbes listen. Okay, so I should just say that everything I'm going to talk about and all the images that I present uh, are published in this editorial. Um, on, this, on this topic, it was published this year, it's open access, you're very welcome, of course, to, 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 to read it. And it's a big international group of co-authors, big international project. It was only going to be a few pages long, but uh, you can probably see here it turned into a labour of love, 43 pages. And this is part of a bigger programme led by Ken Timmis. The micro microbiology literacy program. So I'll just give you a bit of background that first. Uh, well, first of all, there's, a, there's a, a, another editorial that preceded uh, the excursions one on this, the urgent need for microbiology literacy in society. Again, a big international group. And this is what the project is about. There's really six main tasks. The first is to develop a curriculum with all sorts of topic frameworks. And these topic frameworks are essentially microbiological stories that teachers can take and adapt for all age groups. And these are all in progress. And I'll just give you a little flavor for what these look like. They're on all sorts of, of topics. So this one is on pet dogs. And 
Each of these topic frameworks begins with a child-led question. So this one is, Daddy, Raphael has just been given a gorgeous little puppy for his birthday. Can we have one? I'm sure many parents are familiar with this question and there's no doubt that the, the puppy there is psychologically wonderful for and it also has many other benefits, but also some microbiological issues. So in each case, we'll look at, we look at uh, the underlying microbiological issues and importantly, the connections to sustainable development goals and other global challenges. So some examples in this case of, of what we talk about. So dogs mediate exposure to, to many different microbes and that's important for the development of a healthy immune system. So that's a positive feature of dog ownership. On the more negative side, dogs may catch a number of different infections, and some of these rarely can be transmitted to humans. And then that raises issues also of vaccine and antibiotic use. So all these peripheral topics are discussed and brought together, all centered around this very particular question from a child. And then there's the issue of dog food, uh, which has a significant environmental impact and contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. Why? Because it comes from cattle, and cattle that have a rumen packed full of methanogenic archaea that liberate methane through the burping of the cows. So that just gives you a flavour of these topic frameworks and what's involved. We also have within this uh, resources uh, uh, for, for teachers and ideas. Uh, for uh, class activities. And then there's a section or, or a, a component that's about class experiments. And then there's the class excursions uh, aspect that I'm going to talk about in detail. And then a whole bunch of other teacher aids, videos, games, cartoons, comics, books like you've just seen. And then there's going to be a trialing of the frameworks in schools next year and a big thing is to try and get the message across and pursue the ministries of education we can all help with that and everyone is welcome to get involved at any level with this project okay so i'm going to talk specifically about uh, excursions why excursions what are the educational societal benefits of having an excursion. Well, no excursion will exclusively be about microbiology. Okay, let's use the example of uh, going to a, a cheese manufacturer, taking class out to a cheese manufacturer. You'll learn, yes, about lactic acid bacteria, you'll learn about other microbes added to the cheese to enhance flavour, for example. But you'll also learn about global issues, the feedstocks, how they're transported, the carbon footprint of the process, how to deal with the waste. And then you can learn about local issues, the history of cheese making in the region, the local pride associated with it, and importantly, potential job opportunities. And then excursions tend to be a multi sensory experience. So I show you some, a picture here of some dead fish. You see dead fish. I take you out into the field. You don't only see the vast number of dead fish in this case, you smell them. And then you can look around, you can use your vision and you may see, for example, an algal bloom. And then you look further and you see that the lake's surrounded by agricultural fields. And then you start making connections, and this raises questions. What's causing these fish to die? Is it a runoff of nutrients from agriculture? And then who are the algae that are blooming? Are they producing toxins, or are they affecting the fish in other ways? And why do the fish smell? And all of these have microbiological issues. The fish smell is due to uh, bacteria that break down and metabolize in the fish to produce trimethylamine. You've got issues uh, uh, associated with uh, aerobic 
respiration, depleting the oxygen, oxygen and uh, the nitrogen cycle in the field. So you get the whole picture if you go out and see things in reality. And there's very good evidence that being in natural surroundings improves learning. And in particular, it's beneficial for those who do not thrive in the traditional classroom. And then this type of, type of learning provides a bridge to and enriches so-called informal learning. So example, informal learning is, is, is where you learn from watching the TV or going to the shop. So for example, if you've been to a cheese manufacturers and you go out for lunch with your family, you can start to tell them about how the brie in the sandwich was made and the microbiological uh, processes involved in sharing that with friends and family. Excursions are also good because you're exposed to new teachers, so it's enriching in that way. As I said before, it's an introduction to potential future careers and ultimately uh, educational fun activities for children and importantly for teachers, part of their development too. Okay, so I've extolled the virtues of going on an excursion, but come on, we're in a pandemic here, so we have to be uh, sensible and, and, and uh, live within the rules uh, that are driven by uh, a particular microbe called COVID-19. Um, but we can take advantage of this terrible situation because children's interest in microbes has been peaked. They have been affected incredibly by this pandemic. And we need to harness that and also uh, to bring a bit of balance uh, to talk about beneficial uh, microbes. And also, perhaps it's better to do some learning outside. And we don't need to go on a coach over to a cheese factory to go on an excursion. We can think local and go to the school pond compost team. We can look at fungi, algae, lichens, iron oxidizing bacteria, and so on in local buildings. We can build our own Winograsky column. So these are two Winograsky columns that my daughter made during lockdown. Very simple to make, just a cut off bottle, fill them with a bit of mud. This came from an estuary uh, and the associated water. And actually we did a sub experiment here. This one was incubated in the dark and this one on the right was incubated in the light. And you can see that they're very different. Here it's green, phototrophic uh, organisms and purple, again, so-called anoxygenic phototrophs. Whereas this one is just pure black, which is a consequence of sulfate reducing bacteria. They produce sulfide, it reacts with the iron minerals and turns black. But you've got two very different ecosystems depending on the presence of light. And these evolve over time so you can look at them the, the communities, uh, the succession of those communities. And don't just restrict yourself to looking at them, take a whiff. So we open this bottle on the right, and it's not okay, it's slightly pain seaweed on the left here, where there was nothing to mop up the sulfide that's being produced. Stunk, it's like the, the bowels of hell had opened and then you get this horrible sulfide rotten egg stench that, that permeates your whole body for about a day. So it's important to use all your senses when looking at things like this. There's also some fantastic tools out there uh, for, for teachers. Uh, so this is something called a mud watt and this allows you to look at electricity production by microorganisms and it's not too pricey. And here we have something called a fold scope. And this costs about one euro. And it's a microscope that you can make and use out in the field. It's an absolutely fantastic tool. Okay, so we can also take excursions home, uh, replace a trip to the shops with a trip to the kitchen. The kimchi, the chocolates, and the cheeses. So we're using our vision. Uh, we can obviously use our sense of smell and, and, and taste, and, and all the time exploring microbiology involved in manufacturing these different uh, fermented foods. And we can look at texture. For example, this Stilton cheese. 
it's a bit squishy in the middle and it's hard on the outside. And the only sense we can't immediately use is sound. However, you can in a special way if you have access to this device or at least to the internet to look at this device. This is amazing. This is called a fermentophone developed by Josh Rosenstock. It's a, an art installation, hands-on art installation. And each of these bottles is um, vegetables or, or fruit that uh, is being fermented. See the manometers there. And he has cleverly turned the activities of the microbes, i.e. the production of gas and the bubbles produced into sound using little microphones that are placed uh, in these devices, in these bottles. And really, I recommend that you just Google this and listen to a bit of wonderful microbial jazz. Okay, you can also bring excursions into the classroom. We have citizen science, and, and in the editorial that I pointed you towards, um, there's lots of examples of, of uh, where classes can get involved in citizen science microbiological projects. Just one I'd like to mention is from University College London, and they've got a scheme where you can do your own experiments at home, taking bioplastics, you know those envelopes you get, or packaging that's labelled as bioplastic, put it in some compost or some soil, and test whether it really is biodegradable. Uh, this is a little experiment that I've done. So here we have on the right is petroleum-based plastic, polypropylene, and here we have a bacterially produced bioplastic called polyhydroxyalkanoate. Put it in compost for two weeks, and you can see that the polypropylene is undegraded at the top here, you can just about see it, whereas the bioplastic in this case has degraded significantly in that time. And then there's all sorts of, of ways you can bring scientists in. For example, Skype a scientist or other means of communication are available. I just show you here some of the wonderful places that my PhD students go to. And um, I'll, I'll just highlight this one in particular. This is down the deepest mine in uh, the UK. It's a salt mine and I took a bunch of postgraduate students down there. Uh, and while we were there, there were people, we were doing microbiology, but they were testing out um, this rover device uh, with a view to how it could be used, for example, on Mars. And while we were down there, Charles Cockle uh, set up a, a Facebook Live event uh, where we transmitted from this deep mine to schools all over the world great events uh, like that and, and different ways of sharing science with uh, pupils in the classroom. So I encourage uh, teachers to, to do that and to use us. Okay, so um, in better times, there's all sorts of places we can go uh, from agriculture, the garden center through to museums and zoos. I just want to finish by highlighting uh, one particular example, all of these are, are, are expanded on massively in, in the editorial. So I just want to talk about the environmental industry of biotechnology sector and in particular wastewater treatment facilities or sewage treatment uh, undergraduate students, but, but I know that the they're very welcoming to school trips as well, uh, in normal times that is. And this is Colchester Wastewater Recycling Plant, it's run by Anglia Water. And the big advantage of going here is that most towns have uh, one of these and they're often very accommodating to visits. You definitely get a multi-sensory experience and you know when the sewage treatment has worked. And children love poo and that kind of thing. You also have an abundance of microbiological topics. So, for example, you can talk about biofilms on, on chicken filters. You can talk about flocks. So here we have flocks of organic matter and bacteria building up around them and dragging them down, thus allowing the separation of the water and the organic matter organic matter from the system so water can be released after some further treatment uh, into waterways 
And in so doing, you're removing pathogens. And then this sludge, this activated sludge, driven by microbes, can be pumped into this building here. Okay, and this, you can then you can start to bring in the issue of the circular economy, i.e. getting energy from waste. And here, the sludge and other waste is broken down by microbes into smaller units, sugars and, and, and uh, uh, fatty acids and so on. And then it's pumped into another unit where methanogens produce methane, which this time, unlike in the cows, is harnessed for our benefit and converted into electricity. And there's a whole host of other things that can be explored in a wastewater recycling facility. Okay, so an ultimate slide. Uh, uh, we made quite a few recommendations, uh, schools, government, commercial organisations, uh, and it's great to see learned societies like them doing such a brilliant job uh, today. One thing I just want to try and highlight and really, really push is for broadcasters. We know that microbes have a massive effect on the planet and on human health. And we really need to accelerate the inclusion of microbes into wildlife documentaries, commensurate with how important they are for the planet. And I'd just like to thank you for listening, to remind you that all of this and more is available in this editorial. I'm very happy to take any questions. And uh, we're starting to get this translated. It's translated already into Spanish and other translations are ongoing and all of it is currently available on the SBAN website listed. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Terry, very much. Um, I think that note about broadcasters is super important because um, you're right in the sense that, you know, that microorganisms are beautiful, very easy, well, possible to video and don't make it into micro, uh, into um, uh, wildlife documentaries in the way that probably they should. Um, on that note, later today at uh, three o'clock UK time, we're doing a microscope hour on the live stream and we will be filming and looking down the microscope, which I actually have over here, and trying to look at as many microbes as we can find in some samples of Delft pond water. So hopefully we can pave the way for broadcasters to do this more. But thank you very much. Brilliant. Talk. <laughs>